Now to our very first story, and the Speaker of Parliament has declared four seats in Parliament vacant following a petition by Member of Parliament for Tamale South, Haruna Idrisu. Now the effect of the ruling is that the NPP will now have 135 members in Parliament, whilst the NDC will have 136 members. Honourable Members, it is important to point out that the Speaker is called upon by the Standing Orders of Parliament particularly Order 18, to inform the House of the occurrence of a vacancy of the seat of a member under Clause 1B to E, G and H of Article 97 of the Constitution. Accordingly, I proceed to inform the House that by the notification of the polls, the following members of parliament have, by their actions, vacated their seats in parliament. The members are Honorable Peter Yao Kwache Aka, NDC MP for Amenfi Central in the Western Region, now referred to as an independent parliamentary candidate for the same constituency. Two, Honorable Andrew Amwako Asiyama, independent member for former constituency in Ashanti region, now referred to as MPP parliamentary candidate for the constituency. Three, Honorable Kojo Asante, MPP MP for Suhum in the Eastern region, now referred to as independent candidate for the same constituency. And finally, Honorable Cynthia Mamile Morrison, MPP MP for Agona West constituency in the central region, now referred to as independent candidate for the same constituency. These MPs cannot be allowed by law and my good self to continue to pretend to be representing people that they don't believe in and they don't have any loyalty for in this house any longer. The House is accordingly so informed. Honorable members, I thank you for your patience and attention. And soon after the ruling, the leaders of Parliament reacted. Leader of the NPP, Kokos Afenu Markin, said the Speaker had no right to interpret the Constitution. Leader of the NDC, Kokos, on the other hand, praised the Speaker for his judgment. In your, in, your, in your ruling, my understanding was to the effect that your duty is not to interpret the Constitution. My understanding was to the effect that your duty is not to interpret the Constitution. But Mr. Speaker, it is important for me to emphasize one more time that when the statement was made by my respected colleague, Dr. Kaisel Atufosel, I did draw the attention of the House, including your good self, to the fact that the matter being a very grave matter, I have taken it upon myself to seek the court's interpretation of the matter. Mr. Speaker, indeed, yesterday, Parliament was duly said. Mr. Speaker, the facts you put out are not true. Mr. Speaker, these are credibility issues, so I will respond honorable, for the record. Honorable, honorable. Mr. Speaker, somebody has told you something. Mr. Speaker, you reserve the right to be there to make your point. Let me make my point too. Mr. Speaker, no way. Mr. Speaker, no way. I will... Mr. Speaker, whoever told you that I threw a paper at somebody, this has to do with my credibility. I will not allow hands you know, up. Honorable member, you don't listen at all. Mr. Speaker, I do. I never said Mr. you. Mr. Speaker, you said... I, I never said... said you threw a paper at anybody. Mr. Speaker... I Mr. Never Speaker, said that. that's exactly what you said. Let the answer check it. You Mr. See, Speaker, that is what you said. You are being carried away by your Mr. anger. Speaker, you are mean, not I'm listening. Not... Please, resume your seat. Mr. Speaker, as I said, permit me to congratulate the NDC Majority Caucus. Yeah. Mr. Speaker, from day one, from day one, we have not reneged on our responsibilities to work for the people of Ghana.
Today is the beginning of the process to reset Ghana. Yeah. The speaker, our country has gone through a lot. We have always made our point, but unfortunately we've not been able to succeed because we're not having the working majority. But now we have the working majority. Yeah. Right, Honorable Speaker, beginning the next parliamentary sitting will begin the process to take over as the majority caucus of this parliament. And we thank you for the opportunity. Mr. Speaker, we have taken note, we have taken note of the fact that our colleagues, the minority caucus, the new minority caucus have just worked out. But that will not stop us from doing what is right for the people of Ghana. We will do what is right. But their conduct exactly reflects the work of a minority caucus. Mr. Speaker, we thank you very much for this ruling. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Interesting developments there in the House of Parliament uh, a few hours ago. Um, let's go live to our colleague Crosby Anand. He's been <clears throat> following developments in Parliament. Crosby, uh, what can you tell us? Right, so, uh, Papi, so just like you know, it has happened now. Uh, the seats have been declared vacant. And right now, I speak with you. The now majority caucus in Parliament, I'm talking about the NDC, uh, they have begun processes to transfer themselves from the then minority into the now majority. So I'm talking about the processes that are expected to happen going forward. You know that the election of a second deputy speaker has to happen. And now knowing that there's no independent uh, member of parliament, it means it will have to come from the part of the NDC. And you know that the speaker already has affiliations to the NDC. So if there is a second and the first deputy speaker, Joe Weiss, is from the NPP. So if there is a second deputy speaker, it means he has to come from the fold of the now majority and the NDC is what I'm talking about. After that, we're also looking at some names transfers or the rearrangement, if you like, tax and all of that. So all the names of the then minority members of parliament belonging to the NDC will have to be lifted and put on the right side of the speaker who they will then form as a majority in the house going forward until uh, the next elections and the next uh, session of parliament. These are some of the things that are expected to happen. Also, the committees in parliament, I should tell you that we'll also see major shakeups. We're talking about uh, the committee heads as well as the composition of the committees. You know that a lot of the committees, depending on which committee it is, is having either a person from the majority as the chair of the committee, somebody from the minority as a ranking member and all of that. All of that will be affected by the now changes that we're seeing after the seats were declared vacant. So there's a lot of work expected to happen since this ruling has been given by the speaker. It's not going to be, it, it looks very fun. It looks very interesting on the face, but there is huge workload on the shoulders of the now majority. And they tell me that uh, they are very confident that they'll be able to do it properly and make sure that they serve the people of Ghana. Well, after the, the speaker made this ruling, the minority, now minority, I'm talking about the NPP led by their leader, Apio Makin, they addressed uh, the press. And in the address, uh, they were very sure in their minds that this was a wrong decision that the Speaker of Parliament has taken. And he's doing that because he is uh, conniving with the, uh, with the NDC, now the majority part of the House, to frustrate government business. So he says that from henceforth, I beg your pardon, henceforth, they, the MPP side of the House, are going to boycott parliamentary proceedings until the substantive case is determined by the Supreme Court, which he filed an application there uh, a few days ago after the former minority leader, Harun Idrisu, asked the Speaker of Parliament to declare these seats vacant. He spoke with the media when he made these allegations and said that the majority side, sorry, the former majority side, the now minority, will boycott uh, parliament until the case is determined. We'll take a listen to him shortly. But after that also uh, was uh, Kate C. Hammond, also a leading member of the of the NPP in parliament, very uh, vociferous. He has also been saying that, you know, this is coming, This uh, the president of the Formula case, and 
uh, Katie Yamon is telling us that the then speaker, Michael Quay, was horribly wrong. Now he's saying it. And he's saying that he was wrong, they accepted, but the speaker should not have followed in his steps, should not have followed in the footsteps of the former um, former Speaker of Parliament. So these are some of the dynamics happening. Let's take a listen to what Apinio Marking said. When we come back, we'll talk more about the reactions of the now majority, the NDC side of the House. We've just witnessed a conspiracy between the Speaker and the minority to bring confusion in the House. It is clear that Mr. Speaker avoided service of the writ to do the bidding of the NDC. It's so clear, but we believe in the law. We, as the majority caucus, immediately, immediately, are boycotting Parliament until this matter is determined by the Supreme Court. The, 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 the Speaker has no right to interpret the Constitution and it is so clear that what he did was to give advantage to the NDC and do the bidding of the NDC. We are not going to go further to litigate. We have a process at the court. We will fo follow it up if the court makes a pronouncement, we we'll respect the orders of the court. But because we believe that the issues we have raised are issues for interpretation. I've just moved from minority to majority. In fact, the people of Ghana voted for the NDC majority. But if not certain machinations, this should have happened from day one of this parliament. But you see, finally we are here. We are here to do the business of the people of Ghana. We are here to begin the process to reset our country. Our country has gone through very difficult times. In fact, oftentimes, we have blamed, the people of Ghana have blamed Parliament for not standing up for the people of Ghana. But obviously, you can't blame the NDC minority because we are not having the working majority. Today, we have the working majority and we begin the process to reset our country. We want to use this opportunity to assure the people of Ghana that the NDC majority will stand for the people of Ghana any day, any time. We will begin the process to move to the majority side and elect a new second deputy speaker on Tuesday. We have gone through so much, so much as a country, and this cannot continue. We thank the Speaker for standing with the people of Ghana, respecting the Constitution of the Republic of Ghana, respecting President and the standing order of the people of Ghana, of, of the Parliament of Ghana. You know, all of this, we thank the people of Ghana by standing for, 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 for standing. We're going to stay a while longer on this developing subject. I can see a lot of you are taking interest uh, on our social media pages. Let's know what you think of unfolding developments. Let's go live now onto Zoom to speak to Dr. Rashid Rahman. He's executive director for the Africa Center for Parliamentary Affairs. Thank you very much, sir, for your time. So it appears this eighth parliament of the Fourth Republic will go down in history. First of all, it, it gave us the Hank Parliament and now a decision which ultimately tilts the balance of power. Did you see this coming? Yes, Marcus, um, I saw this coming um, the very day that this um, news broke that the former minority leader was going to move this uh, motion on the floor of the House. I said to myself, it's going to be very difficult for anybody to try to do something different from what happened in the seventh parliament. Um, you know, when speakers rule, they rely on First of all, the Constitution, they rely on the standing orders, and they rely on precedence. Uh, I think in all these, I believe today that's what the Right Honorable Speaker did. Um, there are some who will agree with him and some who will disagree with him, and I believe that's the case with um, the MPP side of the House. 
But I believe that, you know, as a country that is governed by laws, um, the right thing that they are doing is to go to the court. So let the court uh, tell us what uh, they are reading of, uh, of what the right honorable speaker relied upon to make his ruling today. What they are reading What you're is. essentially saying, Dr. Draman, is that you have no qualms at all with the, the speaker's ruling on this matter because the decision he took today is fortified by the constitution, by the standing orders, and by precedents. Yes, indeed, I don't have, because my reading, and let me say I'm not a lawyer, I'm a political scientist, and I've been following our parliament over the years. Uh, and most of the time, we look at what happened in previous parliaments, even though, as the speaker himself said today, I mean, that does not necessarily tie the hands of a uh, of, uh, new speaker. But I think what ties his hands um, are the provisions of the constitution and the, the standing orders. And I think, um, I don't think that my reading of, of those provisions are different from his readings. I mean, there are different interpretations, uh, but you know, a few days ago uh, or yesterday indeed, when the debate was going on, I was, my attention was caught by a submission made by the honorable member for North Dai, uh, honorable Dafia Mako, when he spoke about the automaticity of some of these provisions of, of the law. And he made uh, reference to what happened when the Right Honorable Dua Jaho was elected Speaker of the Sixth Parliament. Automatically, he lost his seat and then somebody else was elected and so on. Uh, and if we look at what happened in the Seventh Parliament, true, um, the party wrote to the Speaker uh, to seek uh, his leave to declare the seat vacant. Uh, but the seventh parliament is not the eighth parliament. Eighth parliament is one where the balance of power is very tight. Uh, and I was not going to see the MPP commit suicide by writing to the speaker and saying, declare these seats vacant. <laughs> those who argue, those who argue that, you know, these people really haven't left the party uh, you know, I heard the speaker today say the record of poll, I think the data from the, our election uh, management body indicate clearly that these people have filed to contest uh, on the ticket of uh, their own as independent and not on the ticket of the party for which they went into parliament. And there are those who would also argue, uh, how could we see that, I mean, this is for the future, <laughs> but I think that the relationship between those individuals and their party, that is both the NDC and the MPP, because there's an NDC member as well, the relationship between those MPs and their parties, right. uh, those relationships have been broken. Right. Uh, and so really, I think, I mean, if you put all together, uh, well, uh, what happened today, for me, I expected it, uh, but I think this is the first time uncharted territory. Uh, let, let the Supreme Court tell us whether maybe that is strong, and I believe that will fortify our democracy as we go into the future. So I want to appeal right. to the leaders of our parliament, I mean, both the majority, I mean, the, the NDC and the MPP, I think to keep uh, their heads cool and uh, and and believe in the rule of law and let the rule of law uh, be one that prevails. Thank you very yes, much. Uh, thank yes. you very much, Dr. Rashid Rahman, uh, as with the Parliamentary uh, Affairs uh, Directorate. Thank you very much for your time on News 360. Uh, let me hop onto the other lines now and speak to a former director of the Ghana. Uh, School of Law, uh, Dr. Ansa Asare. Uh, I believe I got that right, Mr. Ansa Asare. I believe I got that right, sir. Thank you for your time on News 360. Um, do you honestly think that the Supreme Court uh, will have a say ultimately uh, in the secession? Well, thank you very much. I, I think that um, <clears throat> Either now, either of the political parties, you know, resent to it that the right 
in the, to check the correctness of the future institution uh, in the Supreme Court. But as to whether um, what the House did today may be overturned, overturned by the Supreme Court, you know, in the, um, you know, the in, in, like in the open. But honestly, uh, I believe that um, the, the House uh, exercised its authority, you know, in the um, in conformity with, with, with the rules of the House. Indeed, not only the rules of the House, which are the standing orders, but also based on the law and precedents. Yes, it's based on the law and precedents, and the law and precedents go in favor of the speaker's uh, ruling. Because all the precedents we, we've had so far in the show that um, the, the Supreme Court, you know, will not take to question, you know, the, the, um, the functions of Parliament, you know, where they are carried out in the regular exercise of the resolution of Parliament. The only uh, opportune time that the Supreme Court needs to be overturned is when it believes that um, the, the rules were specified and that the conditions were not fulfilled. Now, in this case, uh, I doubt very much whether the rules is in but, 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 but finally, you must give it to the, the, the majority side led by uh, Apenio Markins for their decision to seek solace in the Supreme Court. They, they sought to injunct the Speaker from, from going ahead to make the decision. You must give it to them. The question again, please. I'm saying that you, you must give them some credit for, for, for seeking to uh, go to the Supreme Court in a quest to injunct the Speaker from going ahead to make the decision, uh, albeit unsuccessful. I don't seem to follow the question. You know, line is breaking. I'm afraid we've got to leave it here, but I thank you for your uh, contribution to yeah, our program thank tonight. Thank you very much, Dr. Uh, Mr. Ansar Asari is a former director of the Ghana School of Law. Still staying on the Speaker of Parliament's ruling, NDC flag bearer John Dramani Mahama says the NDC becoming the majority in Parliament is a sign of good things to come the way of the NDC. If the report I am hearing from Parliament is true, then something historic has just happened. The report I am hearing is that the Speaker has declared four seats vacant. Of the four seats, three are from the MPP and one is from the NDC. So if those seats have been declared vacant, then it means in the life of one parliament, the minority has turned to the majority, and the majority has turned to the minority. So for me, God is even showing a sign of what is going to happen. Because even before we have cast one single ballot, the NDC has become the majority. But we have to make it a reality on 7th December 2024. And that is when the people of Ghana are going to cast their votes. And now the National Democratic Congress, the NDC, has vowed to overturn the Electoral Commission's disqualification of their Memphis Central candidate, Joanna Jan Kujo, a move it has described as baseless and unconstitutional. The party in a press conference announced that it has secured an interlocutory injunction to prevent the EC from printing ballots for the parliamentary race in that constituency. In a fierce rebuttal, the NDC has described the move by the Electoral Commission as part of a broader scheme to weaken their position in the constituency. The party says the EC's actions are based on an expired injunction that lacks relevance, but only a plot to manipulate the democratic processes. The EC, in an act of sheer disregard for the legal processes and justice, has chosen to disqualify a candidate based 
on an expired and irrelevant interlocutory injunction tied to a completely different election. This blatant abuse of authority, this overt manipulation of the democratic process, and this audacious attempt to deny the people of Memphis Central their right to representation cannot and will not be tolerated. We recognize this for what it is, an orchestrated plot to weaken the NDC in key constituencies, tip the electoral scale, and sabotage the will of the people of Ghana. I therefore declare Donald Trump to do as a parliamentary elect. The NDC General Secretary, while recounting event leading to Joanna Jankujo's disqualification, accused the AC of taking partisan decisions that are morally indefensible. This is nothing short of a travesty of justice. It is a violation of the right of our candidates, and more importantly, a violation of the right of the people of Memphis Central, who have made their voices heard through their votes. The decision to disqualify Joanna John Kujo it's legally baseless, morally indefensible, and a slap in the face of our democratic principles. From Sal to Amethyst Central, the EC's actions reveal a dangerous intent to rig the elections. Not through the ballot balls, but through legal trickery and administrative subterfuge. To this effect, the NDC has begun legal processes to bar the Electoral Commission from taking any further action on their parliamentary candidate for their Memphis Central constituency. We had cause to be filed at the registry of the High Court during the uh, general jurisdiction, a writ with an accompanying uh, injunction application. That injunction application, together with the rates, was promptly served on the Electoral Commission. The NDC has vowed not to rest until Jane Mensah and her colleagues are removed from office. Christian Yale, TV3 News, NDC headquarters. Now, government has announced plans to add dialysis treatments permanently to the National Health Insurance Scheme. The Chief Executive Officer of the National Health Authority, Dr. Da Costa Abuaji, stated that the board will be meeting next month to finalize the decision, which will be key to sustaining the free dialysis initiative for renal disease patients in the country. It is estimated that 11% of Ghana's population has kidney disease, with 8% requiring regular dialysis. The National Health Insurance Authority began absorbing the cost of dialysis for all patients in June, covering varying proportions with vulnerable groups receiving 8 free sessions per month. The free dialysis program, which started 4 months ago, is scheduled to end in 2 months. Since the announcement of the initiative, there have been some concerns about its sustainability after the six-month duration expires. However, the Chief Executive Officer of the National Health Insurance Authority has allayed these concerns, assuring that there are plans to sustain the initiative. The team is actually working on seriously because we've looked at the data and we now know that by the data we can support the dialysis patients to the extent that they are even not able to use the amount of money we've been giving them. There will be positive news, I think, from next month going when the board actually meets to decide on the way forward for permanently adding the dialysis on the NHIS benefit package. Renal disease patients have been responding positively to the authorities promise. It's something we are waiting for. It's something uh, we've been praying for. So we are just hoping to hear from them as soon as possible. We will leave it to them for them to come out and come and explain to us the way forward and how it will go. But we are just praying that it should be a full coverage. The six-month free dialysis program for renal disease patients came into effect after weeks of sustained discussions from the general public on issues concerning dialysis in the country. You are watching News 360 Live here on TV3. We have some business news coming up next. Please stay with us. Good evening and welcome to the business segment on News 360 with me, Menu. 
Afo. Now let's get straight to our details. The declining crude oil production in Ghana is a cause for concern as it has significant economic implications. To address this issue, a technical consultative workshop has urged the government to create a supportive business environment to attract investors into the upstream petroleum sector. The two-day workshop organized by the Public Interest and Accountability Committee brought together academics, regulators and players in the petroleum sector. The Technical Consultative Workshop has issued a pressing call for a more conducive business environment to attract investment and revitalize Ghana's declining oil production. Chair of Public Interest and Accountability Committee, PIAC, Emerita Professor Elizabeth Adefio Shandov, emphasized the urgent need for policy reforms to bolster the country's oil sector. There's need to review and update fiscal terms in petroleum agreements to make them more attractive to investors and to develop transparent framework for licensing and regulatory compliance to build investor confidence. Energy analyst Dr. Yusuf Suleimana echoed these sentiments urging government to swiftly implement the workshop's recommendations to stimulate economic growth. I call, you know, on the policymakers, the duty bearers, to ask a mass of agency to resolve all the pending issues in respect to the current IOCs, unitization with ENI and that of tax issues with Talo. I think these are very important. And once these issues are resolved, this, I believe it will be a, a game changer and it will turn the tide in improving Ghana oil production. Another energy analyst, Kwame Jantwa, advocated for a more strategic approach to managing Ghana's oil revenues. He emphasized the need to care project delays and cost overruns by focusing on targeted investments. Jantua proposed amendments to the Petroleum Revenue Management Act, PRMA, to prevent the indiscriminate allocation of oil wealth across various projects and sectors. The four priority areas, is this something we should look at and change that to something else where we say to ourselves all revenue would be used for specific projects. We have stretched the revenue so thin that we sometimes can't even finish the projects we invest in. In more stories, former Deputy Energy Minister and Ranking Min Member of the Mines and Energy Committee of Parliament, John Abdullahi Jinnapur, has stated that a new NDC government will scrap the Gold for Oil program introduced by the Akufuado administration. This was part of key proposals he made at an energy policy town hall meeting organized by the Chamber of Bulk Oil Distributors in Accra. According to the former Deputy Minister of Energy, John Abdullah Jinapo, government initially claimed that the gold for oil policy would help stem the depreciation of the city against the dollar and keep rising for prices. However, he described the program as a failure, noting that fuel prices remain high and the city continues to depreciate against the US dollar. We are going to take it out, sit with you, and replace it with a workable solution and ensure that the forex is available for you. First of all, that gold you sell gives you forex. That forex should be escrowed. It's about prioritization. If you think that fuel is a major issue and you want to prioritize it, you will do that. But alongside, we are saying that we want to bring on board our refineries. When we bring on board our refineries finally, it means that importation of finished products will go down drastically. As importation of finished products go down drastically, you are adding value to your indigenous crude oil. For his part, former energy minister and deputy minority leader in parliament, Emmanuel Kofibua, revealed plans to review the oil revenue allocation to the Ghana National Petroleum Corporation, GNPC, to enable its focus on its core mandate of oil exploration and production. In fact, what we are going to do is to review uh, the allocations of, of, of the uh, money that we are giving them to the Petroleum Revenue Management Act uh, to make sure we can really focus their attention in building the capacity to make sure that GMPC will lead us in discovering oil. I think that's very critical. The Chamber of Bulk Oil Distributors, however, says members will subject proposals from both the NPP and the NDC to strict scrutiny. 
And now as part of its long-term commitment to providing safety, Bolt, a ride-hailing company in Ghana, has introduced new safety features for both drivers and riders. The Bolt safety strategy, which includes a danger zone notification and comprehensive insurance package, covers the entire trip. Boat's new innovative safety features consist of a rider verification which requires an upload of a selfie and identification document, location sharing and an in-app emergency assist button which enables one to discreetly alert an emergency response team in times of distress during a trip. We also have the audio recording where also in cases of distress, uncertainty on the trip, you can record secretly and then that is sent to also our customer support team. As a driver or rider, you don't have access to the um, recording after you send, um, you can't play back. The senior patient manager of Bolt Ghana, Henry White, further noted that the new safety features are designed to make riders and drivers feel comfortable and safe while strengthening driver-rider trust. We as both are concerned about their safety. We are always developing our apps in a way that we, we consider you know, their safety concerns. So this is the first step. Uh, there's going to be more of this coming and then they should look out for more. The assistant manager for research, business development and innovation at DVLA, Sikantobre, underscored the need for all ride-hailing companies in the country to make safety a major priority for their clients. And so these features as in from from the insurance to the panic buttons to the emergency phone numbers, um, knowing whether the area is safe or not for the driver and all of that are things that we've been championing as authority. Bolt is expected to run a six week campaign to promote its latest safety features on the all in one mobility app. Well, that's it for business here on News 316. My name is Minua Fo. Stay with us. Sports News is up next. Hello there. Good evening and welcome to the sports segment here on News 360. My name is Bill Lishen. And on to our first story. After Ghana's dismal performance against Sudan in the last two AFCON qualifying games, Ghanaians have long waited for a response from key stakeholders in Ghana football. With just two points from four games, Ghana has as close to missing out on the AFCON 2025 as ever. Head coach Otuado has finally spoken and has not given up yet as the Black Stars still technically have a chance of booking a ticket to Morocco. We as Ghana should qualify for the AFCON. It's not over yet. Mathematically, there's still a chance and we will do everything which is in our hands to, to, to hold this chance alive. And reflections on the game... You know, it's like, and I, I think I need to go a little bit, not only on this game, but a little bit more behind. If I reflect, um, and this is, I mean, has, was also when I was a player, this was the case. case you have to win your uh, home games. You have to win them. And, um, you know, the, the, the passion and the, also the discipline defensively, and, but also offensively, position-wise, was, was really, really good. It's just like... We didn't execute and the results were not there. And, um, but surely we deserved to win against Angola and also like the last home game against Sudan. It's not only about getting experience, but also to take the right conclusions of this experience and to reflect on the right points from this experience and to be self-critical. And I'm starting with myself. Then, and if every player does this, then we'll be on our way forward. Before Otuado's long-awaited response became public, Mohamed Kudus, who served as captain for Ghana's last two qualifying games, issued an apology and assured Ghanaians of a turnaround in the future. My colleague Oreko Ampofo believes the statement was in good taste. Bear in mind that Mohamed Kudus is not substantive captain yet. And so this is just captaincy for the last two games and so he didn't have to actually release the statement and so i think that one it was necessary two the timing was great and it came with a lot more weight because at that point the fa ministry nobody had released a statement so kudus's statement became the first voice or a point of reference uh, a point for fans to be able to 
hear something from anything from the football fraternity. And I think the choice of words were good. If you're looking at the reactions from Instagram, uh, there was Majid Ashimeru, Mumin, uh, Kamal Dean Suleimana, Fatau Isaku, a host of players who quickly commented and shared on their Instagram story. So it does once again highlight the influence that he has in camp. And I think it validates Otoado's choice of making him captain at least for these two games. That's it for the sports segment here on News 360. My name is Bill Shen, and there's more on the bulletin after the break. Welcome to the Entertainment News segment. My name is Anita Ikia Ikufu. I'm the Vice President and Flag Bearer of the New Patriotic Party. Dr. Mahmoud Baumia has recognized the employment generation potential of the creative arts industry. He has pledged his commitment to prioritize and champion the needs of the industry if given the nod as a president. Dr. Baumia hosted a crucial engagement with the key members of the Ghana's creative arts and tourism sector on Wednesday night. We want to promote the arts, at the same time promote tourism. The meeting with the vice president was attended by acclaimed musicians, movie makers, fashion designers, sound engineers, talent managers, media personalities and other key industry professionals. The evening encounter with the arts and tourism fraternity formed part of moves to collaborate with stakeholders and position the creative arts industry as a major driver of economic growth. Industry practitioners made known pressing challenges bedeviling the sector. The radio stations in Ghana do not pay royalties. They don't want to pay. Every radio station and TV media house goes to NCA to renew licenses. So I want to suggest that in the system, let us ask NCA that every radio station that comes there to renew licenses, you come with a certificate that you have paid your royalties before you renew your licenses. Other concerns ranged from the need for a strategic investment in the sector, rethinking Ghana's royalty system, and the need for an LI to back laws and policies regulating the sector. I'm asking, with that one and the Act 935 that my brother mentioned, and the cultural policy, and then our broadcast bill. What are you going to do about that? Will you be able to push it through this last uh, uh, sitting? Because without the LI, I don't think that we have proper regulation. We can talk as much as we want. If there are no laws to back it, we can't hold the politician to, to, to bear to that because there's no law. He has just promised you, that's it. And so it's very important to us. Dr. Mahmoud Baumia outlined the NPP's plans to develop the sector into a more lucrative and sustainable industry. He intends to, among other things, establish a creative arts development fund, a dedicated fund aimed at supporting practitioners in the creative industry. This fund will offer financial assistance to emerging talents and provide grants for creative initiatives that promote Ghanaian culture and heritage. Dr. Baumia also proposed the creation of a hub specifically designed for creative sector to offer training in digital tools, content creation, and marketing strategies to help industry players leverage technology for global reach. The flag bearer of the New Patriotic Party also hinted on plans to introduce tax incentives for registered businesses within the creative sector, including event companies. While recognizing the employment generation potential of the creative arts industry, he pledged his commitment to prioritize and champion the needs of the industry if given the nod as president. And when you took, take the creative arts and tourism, this is where you can create the most jobs. Uh, it's very clear. And so, again, if we invest properly in this sector, the creative arts and tourism will get a lot of jobs. Created. And, then, and this is why we have to finish all these theatres that we are talking about. We have to do the streaming. We have to do all the investment. I believe that $100 million, $200 million invested in the creative arts industry really can yield us billions uh, in terms of worth. So I want us to invest in this sector. I'm committing that I'm going to champion the creative arts industry as president of the Republic of Ghana. 
That's it for the entertainment news segment. My name is Anita Ikea Ikufu. Have a good evening. Tonight at the Retre Park in Kumasi, independent presidential candidate and leader of the new force, Nana Kwame Bediako, is launching his ambitious 10-year plan dubbed the seven non-negotiables, along with his flagship program, the 12 Pillars for Economic Freedom. This is part of his ongoing efforts to build an inclusive country, ensuring that every Ghanaian contributes to economic progress and national development. Stay tuned for live coverage of this significant event right here on TV3.